Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't start uh, by providing my own personal uh, support and best wishes to all of your families, particularly those who are feeling the societal and economic impacts and um, the predictable associated stress that comes with that during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is indeed a, a time of great flux and uncertainty. Uh, there's no other way to put it, and uh, we will uh, get through this together, as you hear every day on television, uh, but, um, but we have challenges that we face in front of us. One of the distinguishing features, I would say, of the current pandemic compared to the four others that I've been involved with since I've been in this field for so long, is the 24-7 news cycle in the setting of the back of current politics. Um, we are hearing about anything going on in terms of diagnostics, therapies, and vaccines, and much of it is premature, in my opinion. And so I have growing concern about over-promising and under-delivering to the public, and I think that could set us up for some disappointment later. I'm, after all, an infectious disease subspecialist and a physician scientist, so my background and my views are very much aligned with Dr. Tony Fauci, someone I've been able to work with at the NIH for many years, I know him very well. That is my comments are rooted in science. That's the background, those are the facts that we all need to hear. Um, so I wish to provide you today uh, with some straightforward, accurate information. Um, I planned about 10 minutes of uh, comments to you uh, because I want most of the hour to be addressing your questions, concerns uh, as best I can. So I want to uh, briefly address a few of the latest developments in science. Uh, three topics, actually. Global effort, I want to update you and provide a little more detail on what we're talking about with vaccines and this uh, antibody test that you're hearing about every day. Well, first, I want to tell you, as a scientist, um, the global effort going on to, on the race to cures for COVID-19 is unprecedented. Researchers worldwide are focused on developing potential therapies and vaccines. Um, but having said that, you know, we're still in a reactive mode. We started all of this energy in the setting of a pandemic. And arguably, that's starting behind the eight ball. And so we're trying to get there. Uh, but it's not the, the ideal way to begin an effort like this. You'd like to do it well before a pandemic starts. And maybe we'll come back to that later. But it is a global effort. And I must say, we as scientists are on the phone on, on Zoom every day, uh, worldwide, talking with collaborators. And although it's a very hyper-competitive, you know, there's a lot of people um, working in this area, I think we all have a common mission. And that is we know we need to improve human health by uh, getting some interventions that are going to help people get through this. Um, one of the big committees uh, for, for this, uh, um, um, for the COVID-19 challenge is the World Health Organization as a committee on vaccine development that meets weekly. And just to let you know, Ricardo Carrion, who leads our contract science, which is uh, going very strong right now, uh, is on that call every week. And we get downloads about all the work going on around the world on a regular basis. Um, I spend a lot of my day trying to catch up, and read all these um, manuscripts that are coming online. The second thing I want to talk about is vaccines, and uh, you know, there's um, there are probably over a hundred now vaccines uh, that you read about online, and we hear about a 12 to 18 month uh, timeline, which again, as others have said, that would be faster by a long shot of any vaccine that has been brought to market. I think it's extraordinarily ambitious, and there are many reasons why it would take longer than why it would take quicker, even though news might uh, make you feel otherwise, and I'll come back to that. Look, there are two things you need to do uh, to bring vaccines to, to you and me, and that is to prove that they're safe and prove that they're effective, okay? Safe and effective. And that is a complicated scenario, not simple. Let's remember, for example, that before COVID-19, part of what I discussed with some of you at the Argyle or elsewhere is that we have uh, people who are hesitant to take vaccines, the so-called anti-vaxxers. I'm glad, I'm happy to hear that some are kind of changing their mind now seeing the devastation that can come from a pandemic. But once we develop this vaccine, it actually has to be used. So we have to remember that. The second thing is, what does a vaccine do? So there are different types of vaccines and in the Q&A, I can get into that if you'd like. But what you're trying to do is essentially uh, either on the skin or inject into someone 
uh, some molecules or, or um, inactivated virus to stimulate an immune response. And that immune response then would be primed. Our immune systems would be primed. So then if we're exposed to COVID-19, we actually would be protected under an ideal situation. We would never have any kind of infection. So we first need to know what the proper immune response is. So let me give you a secret that maybe no one has talked about before. If I give a vaccine or a physician gives a vaccine to the public, there are generally three kinds of responses that occur when you give a vaccine. There's one group of individuals that have the perfect response. The immune system is stimulated and they're fully protected, we think, from the virus. The second group will have, because their immune system is different, a different kind of response. And as a result, they'll have kind of weak, weaker protection. That's true, that happens. The third, have a different kind of immune system where the vaccine actually primes the immune response almost too much. So that if an infection occurs afterwards, you actually have such an exuberant immune response that you get a fever or something like this. And that's obviously something we want to avoid. So we have to prove safety and um, we have to understand what that immune response is. Now we think the proper immune response is antibodies which are proteins in our bloodstream that are produced by the vaccine or by natural infection. Are those antibodies protective? What do we know today? Years ago, um, there were some studies, actually human challenge studies with the usual garden variety type of coronavirus of which COVID-19 is one. Because maybe you didn't know this, but every year up to 30% of our mild respiratory infections are due to coronavirus, not the outbreak strain. This is different. This is a brand new virus but it's kind of its relative. Um, so human challenge uh, studies with the coronavirus uh, has shown that you can produce antibodies and under those conditions, people are protected for up to three to four years. Now, how about SARS back in 2003 or MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, all coronaviruses, what do we know about them when they occur? Well, first, we don't have a vaccine for them. Uh, and we know that antibodies are, were produced in people infected, are produced with people infected. Uh, but we don't really know how uh, long that protection is or whether that protection is full, that is robust. And with COVID-19, we don't know yet. We don't know. So we have to do more investigation to understand that. And the way we do it is two ways. One, which you hear about a lot, which are clinical trials. There are typically three phases. The first phase, and this has been accelerated with COVID-19, are safety studies and usually 40 to 50 healthy people. Um, and that is unprecedented. We've gone quickly to phase one. Phase two and three are larger and more expensive studies, and they're on safety and efficacy. And we collect blood samples and things of that nature, and we can learn some things. In parallel, however, and less said on the news, is we need validated animal studies, preclinical animal studies, where we can study the immune response in a more controlled fashion, develop more information. And it really is the package of human studies and animal studies combined that the FDA will look, look at and become comfortable that a vaccine can come to market, okay? So it's a process, a complicated process on safety and efficacy. And you have to manufacture the vaccine. And you've been hearing that some acceleration of manufacturing of putative vaccines is going on right now, and that can cut some corners too. So you can cut some corners, but it's still a process where it can derail at any time. And actually, even some of the therapies that you heard about so promising have already been debunked. So um, we have to pay attention to uh, rigorous uh, research. The third topic is this antibody test. <clears throat> now, it's a segue right from the vaccine. So there are two types of tests just to keep them very clear, one is more of a diagnosis test, which is called the PCR polymerase chain reaction test. This looks for virus in you, um, and that's the test where we've been really behind. Uh, we have not nearly had enough of those tests available uh, to the public to understand, and, uh, you know, to test everybody who may have an infection. Then there's this antibody test, and the antibody test um, really is looking for those antibodies in the serum. That's a blood test. And that blood test will tell you that you've either been infected uh, with a natural virus or that you've received, eventually we'll see vaccine, vaccinated people uh, show those antibodies in the blood, at least we hope. 
And so now that antibody test is also known as a serology test. So it's a serum antibody test. And that is not a new kind of test. There are different platforms for it, but here's the problem with them. Historically, they're notorious for what are called false positives and false negatives. What you really want to know is if somebody's positive by that test that they truly have antibodies and they're protected. But if it's false negative, then you could be have a negative test but actually still be protected. And if it's false positive, you have a false assurance that you're protected when you're really not. And these tests need to be validated and calibrated. And there are so many of those tests that are out there on the market right now, and a lot of them are not performing well. So we really do need this kind of test to help us as we think about re-entering uh, into the workforce, something will come up in the q and I'm sure. Okay, well, Texas Biomed, what did we do? We heard about COVID-19 at least two months ago. It didn't take us very long, within a couple of days based on our mission to say, we gotta go in here. We, we have expertise, we have facilities, we have outstanding virologists who study these viruses. We've been uh, um, um, repositioning our institute over the last two years, new facilities. We're primed, we actually were prepared. We put a team of seven scientists together and about 30 staff to commit to coming into the game on the race for cures. And what is our first experiment that we plan, that we plan for? Well, it was based on our longstanding expertise of developing animal models. So this institute really has a, 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 a robust, a strong track record of animal models for HIV, Zika, hepatitis virus, Ebola virus, tuberculosis. We know how to do it. And we know how to do it well. And we know how to do it at a high level of rigor that the FDA appreciates. They know us very well and we really produce high quality product. Doing these animal models has the obvious advantage from what I've said already of testing new therapies and vaccines. And, uh, and we're already in conversations with a number of partners. I'll come back to that on that part. But these animal models will also tell us more about how this virus actually causes infection. Many unknown questions need to be answered. The animal model can help us. How about reinfection? How about somebody who has diabetes? Can we study in diabetic animals what the impact is on COVID-19? And the answer is yes to all of those. So we put the team together. We immediately put the regulatory paperwork in that no one likes to talk about. We got it done in less than two weeks. This is a lot of paperwork to make sure we do things safely, both for animals and for humans. And we asked for your support. And as Corbett already said, within seven days, we had unbelievable support, something that I'm so proud of and so humbled by. Uh, our colleagues, our partners, HEB, USAA, the Mays family, the McCombs family, uh, leaders in our community, entrepreneurs like Graham Weston and others, came in to enable us to have the resources to begin these studies. Our first study, which is nearing completion now, is, um, was studying three species of primates, uh, macaque monkeys, uh, uh, marmoset monkeys, and baboons. And we're the only place that could do the baboons. They'd never been tested for any coronaviruses. And we decided, based on what we were seeing clinically in China in particular, to study young and old animals. Um, and, um, and so we, we went to work. And uh, as I said, we're finishing our studies. We have positive results. We feel like we are definitely going to have a strong animal model coming out of this. Uh, and we're um, going to start writing the manuscript this week uh, and go into a high level journal. Uh, and we're also um, um, beginning to discuss this with our partners. Now, now, who are our partners? You know, we don't live in a vacuum. So in addition, before I get to the partners, in addition to the monkey studies, we're also doing small animal studies. Um, guinea pigs, mice, even ferrets. These represent uh, more uh, smaller tractable model systems. They're, they're less expensive and allow us to test more vaccines and therapies. And we have some other studies going on, some in disinfectants and others, so we can talk about those as well. But importantly, I want to tell you that because of the importance of animal studies, uh, maybe not talked about as much for some, uh, uh, some reasons, uh, big farmers come calling. And um, 
this uh, past week, we signed uh, a, a, preliminary, a pilot study with Regeneron, a company we have a track record with that we worked with to bring a therapy for Ebola virus to the Congo. Now that Ebola virus outbreak is nearing the end as a result of this therapy. I'm extremely proud about, about that partnership. Uh, and uh, we're about to sign at least one other large pharma company. Uh, and we're talking with several others. This is facilitated by our newest senior leadership member, uh, Corey Hallam, who's our vice president for business development and strategic alliances. Has hit the ground running, doing a great job. Lastly, I really want to tell you that um, that staff that I told you about, those 30 people and the, and the faculty, uh, the scientists, um, they're working overtime. You know, it's a time where businesses are struggling. We're mission critical at Texas Biomed. People have been coming in working under safe practice. But they're working overtime. I mean, fatigue is a major factor. I worry about that. Uh, but, you know, we're the leadership team, um, even our, our colleagues at Southwest Research Institute, uh, uh, we've worked on ways to uh, provide some food and other uh, resources to our staff for all the hard work that they're doing. Um, we're also partnering with our colleagues. We have a strong partnership with uh, Squiri, with UT Health uh, San Antonio. We have several projects we're doing with them and UTSA. So we also have continued our strong partnerships within San Antonio. Those are my open comments I wanted to make, uh, and um, I'll finish there. Uh, and uh, let's open it up for some Q&A, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Larry. We have had some questions come in, um, and so I will um, be reading those off again. Anyone who has a question, if you want to uh, type it into the Q&A function, um, there's also a webinar chat function you can send a question through. Um, and then also raise your hand and I can unmute your phone at that time. Um, but the first question uh, that's come up is, we have heard restrictions are being lifted. Um, the governor made his announcement yesterday. Are we ready? And what can we do to protect ourselves? Right, so uh, I, I, it didn't take long. That was the first question. Um, so listen, um, I like everyone else know, there's tremendous desire to begin the process of heading back to being normal in the way we conduct ourselves in society and also from an economic standpoint. So I'm certainly on that side of the fence. We need to find ways to get back uh, to work, to the workforce. Um, I think the governor laid out a aspirational type goals um, uh, for returning. He, he had deadlines and, and dates and more or less said, let's work it out and be safe. Uh, wear masks, this kind of thing. Um, I think that's good, uh, but I think we're still very much challenged uh, to try to figure out what we can do to remain safe. So um, it does include a variety of factors. Um, it definitely includes our still being uh, conscious about social distancing. Um, I think the masks help as a deterrent. I think we need to stay home if we're feeling sick. We definitely need to be washing hands and continuing those hygiene practices that are so important in reducing the spread of infection. But in addition, um, you know, to get more scientific about return, we still need to understand the importance of testing and, uh, and improve that testing, both to diagnose COVID-19 and eventually to have a validated antibody test to give us a sense of how much infection we have in the community. Uh, if you look at the numbers, somewhere between five and in the hot spots, maybe 20% of the population has been infected, and that's not a majority. So we have a lot of people still susceptible to getting infected by COVID-19. Um, and then ultimately, we need a new therapy and a new vaccine, and that is not around the corner. If you heard my comments, that's going to take some time. So I think it's going to have to be strategic. Um, I think we're going to, this idea of contract tracing is very important. If we identify someone with COVID-19 um, through standard epidemiology practices and our public health folks are engaged, the mayor is working with these individuals, there are ways to track who that individual has been in close contact with and to take a strategic approach to who might be quarantined, who might need to be quarantined. I think that's important. The quarantining is important. Um, I think we can get there. 
uh, but I think it's going to have to be refined. We have to think about who are our most vulnerable. Also, let's think about what business we're talking about. You know, there are businesses where you could still work uh, virtual. Uh, you can work in safe distances, and then there are others you can't. Uh, so I think that becomes a real challenge. So a stepwise approach, and really we have to rely upon public health experts, and a variety of these modalities need to be incorporated to develop a better roadmap uh, to getting us safely back to the workplace. Great. Um, another question that came in is, how do I convince my friends that those antibody tests that their concierge doctors are doing are actually not reliable? Well, um, well, I heard Dr. Schlesinger speak to the gold circle about the fact that they're not reliable. Um, I think that uh, that's the fact. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, to, to really prove a test works, you have to have people who are uh, infected, who are not infected, control groups. You have to have the test performed in a blinded fashion and do this rigorously with a statistical appraisal of whether the test is performing the way it's supposed to. And we just don't have that. So um, I think, um, listen to the scientists, uh, to the experts who are saying, uh, not yet. Um, I am on the city's subcommittee for testing, and uh, there will be some more information coming out soon. I think it's gonna say exactly that. Great. Um, another couple of questions, um, but I'm going to combine them. So will UVC or ozone kill COVID-19 virus? Okay, so um, I mean, I think that I've read, I'm aware of what we're, what we're hearing about, and, um, and I think that uh, it's not clear to me that you can reliably uh, uh, depend upon those as the way to kill the virus. Again, uh, you know, every day is a little different in terms of UV exposure for us in general. Um, and I think in the, in the um, closed setting, uh, UV lights are really dependent on potency uh, and, um, and they have a shelf life. Uh, so maybe some effect uh, for sure, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, rely on it. Um, it was reported yesterday that Oxford University may test a new vaccine in 6,000 humans by the end of next month and may be available right. to the public by September. Um, what are your comments there? Yeah, um, so I know the lead investigator, uh, Adrian Hill, he's a colleague of mine. Uh, they're, they've been testing vaccines for malaria for a very long time, and they were doing some work with SARS coronavirus. They have a platform. I'm aware of their vaccine platform. They did a small study. Uh, with a, so we are not the only primate center in the world. Uh, there are a small handful, and one that's owned by the NIH, it's a federal lab, is in Montana called Grothy Mountain Labs. They did a small study, um, and it's not been uh, peer reviewed yet. I haven't seen the details of it um, that suggested the vaccine protected better than the control animals in the laboratory setting. Um, and since the and so so that's part of why they think they can move fast. And as I said, I, I, I've not yet seen the actual data. Um, the original paper, um, not paper, but manuscript I saw from Rock Mountain Labs, had, their animals weren't very sick. Uh, so if they're not very sick and you use a vaccine, it's hard to predict what 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 it means when they say they were protected. Um, and uh, and they have this platform that was previously worked on, so they can cut some corners there. I think they have an aspirational goal, um, and they're working on getting partners and resources to do so. Um, frankly, I think it's terrific that, that they're really pushing. Um, I think it's ambitious, uh, and, um, I, and I'm not certain, but um, uh, let's see. I mean, I think it'd be extraordinary. Um, I, I really, even though they may say we're in a study in September, I still say, at least a year or two away from it being publicly available and approved by regulatory agencies. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here, but what are the different types of vaccines and then what do mutations to the virus mean for a vaccine? Okay, great. Okay, so there, there are a few different platforms for vaccines. 
without getting too geeky here on the uh, virtual conference. Uh, but um, so uh, the virus uh, uh, is a little package of, uh, with some proteins, just a few, a little package of uh, DNA and RNA kinds of molecules, nucleotides. And, uh, and so it's pretty, you know, pretty tiny and there's not much to it. So the advantage of that is there's really only a few what we call targets to, to, for the vaccine to work. So let's see what we can do. First, we can kind of break up the virus and look for the major proteins. And there was one in particular called the spike protein on the surface. And you could actually inject, purify that protein and put it in you. So one approach would be a protein vaccine. It's also known as a subunit of vaccine. The Moderna vaccine from Massachusetts was, okay, we're gonna take messenger RNA, which is the building block to protein, and we're gonna inject the messenger RNA in your skin, um, and then we're gonna let our bodies make the protein. That's their platform, so RNA or protein. Then one can take a, um, another type of virus that is felt to be safe. Uh, vaccinia virus would be one. And you can what's called clone or use molecular biology to put in the uh, RNA again to make the protein. So it's similar to the RNA, so-called naked RNA vaccine, but now it's on a, a virus backbone that allows the virus to multiply and make more of the RNA. So uh, that's been around for quite a while. And then you can inactivate COVID-19, take away what makes it um, uh, cause disease, and see whether it still produces an immune response. And all of those are being looked at. All of those are being considered. Um, the virus we know is mutating. So viruses mutate and they mutate pretty quickly. Um, and by the way, our studies, the first thing we needed to do was grow up what we call the stocks of COVID-19 for all of our studies at Texas Climate. And we had to sequence all of the virus we used to make sure that it was not uh, did not have significant mutations, which would render it harmless, and it didn't. Uh, and that's because we know what we're doing here at the Institute. The mutations that occur naturally, um, uh, here's the good news, almost never change the course of infection. So they're pretty benign, as we say. They don't cause a lot of problems. Uh, and so to date, the virus is still behaving like it did at the beginning. So I'm not aware of any really strong change in the virus that would make it interact with humans differently. So it is mutating, but it's not really causing change in clinical disease. So on that same, in that same vein of staying with vaccines, the press is giving uh, mixed messages about the possibility of reinfection. Will a vaccine be able to address this issue if the virus is able to continually mutate? You know, we don't know. I mean, honestly, again, straightforward with you today, I spent time telling you that we're not sure what the proper immune response to a vaccine is. So we don't really know whether those antibodies will protect you. Based on historical information on coronaviruses, we're hopeful that there'll be some protection, but more work needs to be done. Whether ultimately there are mutations that affect the way uh, a vaccine targets, let's say a specific protein or mRNA, it's possible it's possible that can occur. As I said, most of the time, it should not affect the way the virus causes infection. We know a bit about, a little bit about this virus. We have identified two proteins on the surface of our cells where the virus seems to bind in kind of a, you've heard a lock and key mechanism. And that's what made this virus jump from animals to humans and become effective in humans. So could there be a significant mutation that changes the way the virus interacts with us? Could be. Could be that would affect the vaccine for sure so it's possible um how can the wide variance in presentation of symptoms be explained right so um again uh for some of you who've heard me talk um uh, before remember bugs don't cause your symptoms right bugs don't cause your symptoms of course they ignite it but it's your body's immune system that is trying to get rid of the invader that causes the symptoms. Now, let me give you the antithesis, the opposite end of COVID-19, and that is the organism I study, tuberculosis. Humans have co-evolved with tuberculosis for centuries. 
So there's a very fine relationship between humans and tuberculosis. That isn't the case for COVID-19. This is a brand new virus. So when it comes into us, our body's immune system are going, whoa, what is this? What is this? I don't understand this. And so it tends to overreact. And when the immune system overreacts, it causes a variety of things to happen, like you've heard maybe this so-called cytokine storm. These are molecules released in the bloodstream that can cause fever, chills, night sweats, weight loss, uh, um, all kinds of symptoms. That's our body's immune system. Now there are some intriguing new things we're learning about. We don't really have the answers for here. You've heard about the fact this virus seems to take away your ability to smell. Uh, that's interesting. Gives me thoughts that the virus is hanging out in the back of your throat and nose primarily, and there's something going on there. And the newest concern are these clots that we're hearing about um, that causes people to, to, to have increased clotting propensity and you know we're now hearing about stroke, and the question is, are some of that those clotting problems now leading to clots in the brain? So these are parts of the body's reaction specifically to COVID-19 that we need more science for. Again, answering all these questions in the setting of the pandemic is in my is a is a really uphill battle, right? What Texas Biomed's vision is that we have a sustainable, proactive vision that's working to understand these threats we experience in between pandemics, because there will be the next one. So it's really a group of symptoms that are based on your immune system's response to the virus. Um, so on the topic of immune responses, is there a way to pretest an individual's immune response prior to vaccination? Sure, sure. In fact, I think that's a great idea uh, because uh, you know, a portion of our population has been exposed to coronaviruses or potentially some other related viruses, but I'll say real quickly, there's no relationship between influenza, because that's a question that comes up, and COVID-19. They're very different viruses. But there, we've had some exposure in the community. This is partly why the COVID-19 serology antibody test may actually be a false positive, because you might get a positive result which has some antibodies related to a related coronavirus, but those antibodies would not protect you against COVID-19. So um, I think understanding the natural uh, immunity in the community is something that can come with widespread validated serology. Those are, that's really what epidemiologists like to do. I mean, that's important. You've heard this idea of herd immunity when, 70 or 80 percent of a population actually has specific antibodies to your uh, infectious agent like COVID-19. And then that's enough to really make it hard for that virus to penetrate that population. Another question. Um, I've known a few people uh, testing positive for COVID but are not showing any symptoms. Have you seen similar results in the animal models? And if not, could this be a result of false positives? Well, it always can be a, a, a you know a source of false positive. But let me say that here, I think we're talking more about the PCR test than the antibody test. Um, and that has a sensitivity and specificity much better than the serology. Um, there's more concern about not high enough sensitivity for PCR. That is a false negative. And that's because it's a nasal swab. Maybe some of you have seen this on television. It's a little uncomfortable when you watch it. You got to put a swab in the nose. And if it's not done deep enough or quick enough, you may not have enough material to amplify the virus, um, which is the diagnostic, and that can lead to a false negative test. But we also know, and this has clearly been shown, that uh, a good chunk of infected people are asymptomatic without symptoms whatsoever and test positive. Um, and um, we would think, because the specificity is very high for the PCR test, that those are truly asymptomatic rather than false positive. A little more concerned about small amounts of false negative on the PCR test. So completely different than the antibody test. I don't want to confuse the two. And um, on the track of Texas Biomed in our studies, um, where do you see Texas Biomed going after establishing the animal model for the disease? Will the focus be on testing, vaccines, treatments? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, let me say, we, we have expertise beyond COVID-19. I think you all know this. 
We still have, and we're, and we're recruiting scientists, we're growing. We have great expertise in HIV science, in tuberculosis science, in malaria, schistosomiasis, other hemorrhagic, that continues. So I wanna make it very clear, our institute is growing. We're not deviating to be a COVID-19 institute. Having said that, um, we uh, very much want to continue our studies on COVID-19 once we establish the animal model. And that's why we're signing already these contracts with uh, companies and other partners uh, uh, to be able to test their and vaccines uh, in the pipeline. We'll continue that work. Um, we also have a lot of interest in understanding natural infection, reinfection, so-called comorbidities. You know, our baboons are a great model. Uh, and they do seem to be uh, uh, infected by COVID-19. Um, we know that now. And they're a great model for looking at what's called metabolic dysfunction syndromes, like diabetes, um, obesity, things of that nature, cardio, cardiac problems. So then they would become a really good model uh, to look at COVID-19 in the context of those other diseases. And um, so I anticipate we'll be working at a higher level, um, it will be growing our, you know, um, our um, um, grant and contract portfolio. Uh, today, as we speak, we have um, nearly or about $10 million worth of money submitted to the NIH for research studies. And we have potentially up to 30 million uh, in uh, contract work with um, large pharma. So um, I expect we're gonna be a larger institute working uh, uh, working at a greater scale on COVID-19 as well as the other infectious agents. Um, another question that's come in, what are your thoughts on why COVID-19 is affecting the African-American community disproportionately? Probably not a straightforward answer. Um, I mean, it goes back to maybe something I was just talking about. First of all, it's access to health care. Um, we know for any infection or any disease, um, coming in later is not a good thing. Um, we know there have been, there's been some association with diabetes, hypertension, and some other, uh, um, um, uh, you know, so-called co-diseases that seem to increase the propensity of COVID-19. There's actually a little bit of science around that because with diabetes in particular, the protein that COVID-19 sees may be increased in its expression uh, in these groups. So there may be some underlying medical there's probably as well some socioeconomic in terms of access, um, and, uh, and we have more to study epidemiologically there. But certainly uh, a concern, uh, and at the end of the day, as we say, the virus knows no borders, doesn't distinguish, and we have to come together in our entirety as a population in handling this issue. What are your thoughts on subsequent outbreaks? How might we advise college students for the semesters ahead or um, students in general? Yeah, I mean, this is gonna be a challenge. Uh, you know, I talked about some businesses, let's say at schools, where you can entertain the notion of masks and uh, distancing and uh, temperature checks perhaps, some testing, there are ways uh, that we can uh, protect, but you know, I, 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 every time I think about school, I think about kids going back to school. You know, can you think about your five-year-old wearing a mask and keeping it on? Can you think about social distancing below a certain age group? I mean, this is really challenging for me. I, I think we're going to have to be very thoughtful, and um, and I'm certainly hopeful that our testing will become more available because that's going to be absolutely critical when we think about the school environment in all age groups. Um, you know, stay tuned. Um, we don't, you know, maybe I'm going to uh, preempt a question, you know, about the summertime and warmth and, you know, because we're outdoors and influenza is down in the summer, you know, and we're hopeful, but we have no idea whether coronavirus will go down in the summer. But in all likelihood, we're going to see a spike in the fall, and I'm hopeful by then we have more tools. We have more epidemi epidemiology, public health tools in place, more testing in place. And so we can be more refined in the way we think about school. So that goes along the lines of this next question in terms of are we anticipating a second wave? And it sounds like that is a possibility. Um, when do we predict San Antonio will hit the peak? Well, I think uh, you know some of the modeling predictions say that we're probably two or three weeks away uh, from peak. Uh, by the way, I think to date we've done a good job 
Uh, I mean, looking, we're growing cases. We've had some outbreaks. I know prisons are a challenge in terms of some of our outbreaks. Uh, but I think overall, um, San Antonio has been very responsible in the way it's handled. Uh, social distancing and the mask is a perfect no, uh, you know, but, uh, but um, I think we've done a good job. Um, you know, uh, there was talk about, well, let's look at the infection rates. Let's look within even San Antonio or other cities. And, um, and there are some areas with very low rates, that is low infection per populace. And so maybe those are safer areas to open. As a scientist, I would argue those are, that's not real solid because really what you're doing is if you have somebody come in with COVID-19, that's a naive population. And you can predict reliably, there'll be a spike in those areas. So uh, contract tracing, looking at hot spots and trying to get a sense of where the infection is becomes critical. The other thing that's challenging for us, frankly, is that we're doing this city by city, <laughs> locale by locale, uh, and that's challenging epidemiologically. Remember, people don't just stay in a city, they move among cities throughout the state of Texas, which is a big state. We have neighboring states, and, uh, and I think that if people are doing things very differently, that just increases the challenges further. Um, and so I think there will be spikes. I think the next 60 to 90 days with reopening, we're gonna be hearing news about new hotspots. I, I almost guarantee it. And so I think this is why I say we're in a period of uncertainty. Um, we have to be smart. And so with being smart, and then how can we be proactive to protect these vulnerable communities that you've talked about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the same. I, I've said this. Um, I think that we got to get testing up. We have to continue our personal hygiene practices um, and uh, send out good, accurate messages about what it is to be uh, safe. I think if you are in a, if you are elderly, uh, if you have uh, diabetes that is poorly controlled or that is harder to control, if you've just come off cancer chemotherapy or have autoimmune disease, anything to make your immune system weak, um, this is a time where you know sheltering in place makes a lot of sense because without testing, we don't know who in the community has COVID-19 and you're particularly susceptible. We do know that. So um, you know, I think this is about a lot of uh, public health efforts to get the message out, families to protect themselves and their children, uh, and uh, and let's just take this day by day here at the current time. So in an effort to create sort of safe zones, what do you think about using Abbott's five-minute test to help establish those COVID-free clinics or doctor's office to protect patients and medical staff? Well, I was just reading about the Abbott test and it may not be performing as well as it was billed to be performed. And even that test is being scrutinized right now. Calibration, evidence-based, you know, you need, you need tests to really perform well or it's a disaster. Point of care testing like the Abbott test is critical. We need tests that have rapid turnaround. Tests that take even 24 hours or up to a week uh, really don't work when you're in the middle of a pandemic. So absolutely has the strength of being point of care. Uh, but again, um, what's different about this is this 24-7 news cycle. And, you know, they, they're, they're, um, there are, so let me just tell you that since 2013, we have something new in the science arena. And that is that when I write a paper, typically you submit it to a journal and it's what's called peer review. You have other scientists read it. It takes some time, but you kind of have to make sure the study is valid before the public hears about it. Since 2013, we now have another vehicle where you can take that paper at the time you submit and you can deposit it in a pub public warehouse that the public and journalists and everybody else can find it and report on it. And those studies have not been peer reviewed uh, and that creates a challenge because then we go out and we say, well, this looks good. And then we find out a week later, hydroxychloroquine has no effect and actually has a problem associated with it in terms of uh, side effects. We hear that remdesivir, a very promising Gilead drug, the early studies now suggest it's not going to be good. So, um, you know, I think we need a point of care test. 
I still am open-minded about Abbott, uh, but um, but I just want to make sure it's a good who's infected. Great. So there's a train of thought that returning to normal will help increase herd immunity. In your opinion, is this effective or valid? So this is the Sweden, the Sweden model, right? By the way, we're not Sweden. If you ha if you looked, our demographics are just quite a bit different. Let's just start there. Um, I think that there's way too many people at severe risk for us to just open the, open it up and have infection go rampant and just let the let the strong survive. I believe in the sanctity of life. In that sense, uh, everybody's important, and I I I think uh, you know how many deaths we've been suffering is is tragic. So I I don't think that works for me. I think that's one extreme. The other extreme is that we shelter in place for the next year. That's an extreme. I mean, there, there is really room here for more strategic middle ground. So we have a couple of questions that have come through about wearing masks. Um, is it more for the wearer's benefit or to help stop the spread? And if someone has a disease, has a disorder, um, so they're immunocompromised, will a mask really make it safe for them to go out in public? Okay, so you know it depends which mask you're talking about, and um, uh, and you know many of the thing creative things I see at HEB and other places, um, I will tell you there's no evidence they protect. I just again I'm being transparent and honest about it. Surgical masks have some level of protection. The N95s have high level of protection, and they're not available. The biggest benefit is if you're sick, um, uh, um, having something over your nose and mouth will. Uh, uh, limit the amount of secretions that come out of somebody who's sick. So protecting others is its major benefit. Will you be protected? Uh, a little bit. Uh, social distancing, more important. Um, so I think it has some role, uh, but uh, just to rely on the mask, uh -uh. I think it's washing hands and distancing along with the mask that's necessary. Okay. Um, there are a couple of more questions. Um, one being there, we hear a lot about collaboration and the fact that, you know, scientists are partnering with billionaires um, to, to do things and, um, and really try and combat COVID-19. What are some of the things that we're doing at Texas Biomed and are we part of these efforts, these collaborative efforts to really um, find the therapies and vaccines that we need? Yeah, well, we are part of collaborative efforts. Um, great science is done by collaborative teams. We don't work in isolation. Uh, even prior to COVID-19, Text Biomed has over 200 scientific collaborations. And now, you know, continuing our collaborations with the private sector, with industry. Um, we are in the early stages, still a year or so in uh, to a, uh, uh, a capital campaign, um, and that capital campaign is a 10-year campaign uh, that uh, has the goal of continuing to grow. Uh, our great scientists, we already have uh, over a dozen new ones since I've come. Um, we have a challenge with our campus, even with the increased demand now. We have some plans afoot currently uh, to enlarge our containment facility so we can reach that demand and make sure that we can help um, our partners as much as possible. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, as I said, we have a lot of people who uh, are strong partners and make contributions. Um, we are working very hard, and I can pour a bit all the credit in the world, leading our development group, uh, to send our message more broadly uh, uh, to the uh, state of Texas and beyond, nationally and internationally. I give you, Lisa, a lot of credit. Um, we are working very hard on national stories uh, to build our brand. Uh, strongly in the area of infectious disease. Remember, we built this brand, or we built our mission before COVID-19, uh, but now with COVID-19, we're accelerate, accelerating our brand. Um, we are not in the Manhattan Project group uh, that you're all reading about. That's the billionaire group, but there's several spinoffs. But um, we are speaking with more and more people of great wealth about what we could do, uh, and we uh, any chance we have uh, want to engage such individuals. Each of you who I'm speaking to today, in my opinion, have a role to play. If each of you thought about three of your friends 
uh, that you can go speak to uh, when you, after you're hearing me today uh, and knowing what Texas Biomed is doing and spread that circle. Uh, you know, Zoom makes it very easy for Larry to be front and center with anybody. Uh, and, uh, and I'm ready to help you. Uh, so we have a ways to go. I mean, we have audacious plans, but you know something? We're a unique enterprise. We do things faster. We do things smarter. And we have the quality of science and, 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 and facilities to enable us to do phenomenal things to save, uh, to improve human health throughout this world. Um, and it, it excites me when I get up in the morning to think about what contributions we could make. Uh, and please help us in that regard. Um, uh, you know, I love billionaires, uh, particularly those that are interested in human health. Um, I am on a couple of committees with the Gates Foundation, and Bill Gates has been front and center now. Uh, he's fantastic, uh, but he's not the only one, and we have others. Uh, and now's the time. Now's the time for us to transform the infectious diseases landscape. Hopefully, none of you underestimate any longer the impact of an infectious disease threat on society and our economy. And, and it's not the last one. This is the third coronavirus outbreak. There'll be a fourth. Let's be ready. Let's make this place the epicenter, the innovation hub to change the landscape uh, and, and be ready for the next uh, pandemic. And one of the questions that came in is how can we help Texas Biomed and its scientists and staff? And I know you've answered that partially here. Is there anything else you would like to add to that answer? Well, I mean, keep asking questions, get the facts. As was said earlier, how can I get people to understand the tests aren't ready yet? Um, I think, you know, outreach events like this allow us to really talk candidly about what is and what isn't. Um, and that makes you educated. That makes you someone who's in the community with your friends. Uh, uh, talking about where we are today and what we need to do to protect ourselves. Um, I think that's also important. I feel that infectious diseases is um, really um, poorly understood by a lot of people. You know, whether it be COVID-19 or sepsis um, or superbugs, influenza. I mean, I want the public to really be, I trust the public to be smart and knowledgeable and be are warriors out there telling the truth and helping us. Um, uh, I know we can lead uh, in this domain of infectious diseases. This is what a private not-for-profit nimble institute can do. And I think the future landscape will be these institutes partnering with other academic institutions, foundations, private sector. Together, we get this thing done. All right, Larry, um, we have two phone call in listeners, so I'm just gonna unmute their phones in case they have a question because they're unable to um, type into Q&A. Hey there, is there anyone on the phone who would like to ask a question? Don't be shy. All right. Um, we do have a couple of other questions, but I know we're running out of time, so I will um, make sure that those questions get to Larry and that we get some answers um, back to you as soon as possible. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't quite able to get to everyone, um, but we certainly appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, Corbett, do you want to say any last words? You give me the opportunity, I will. Uh, one thing I've gathered out of this is I'm an elder. Uh, you, you talked about elderly people, Larry. <laughs> I'm an elder. And uh, so, so I guess am I. I so am I. <laughs> I guess I get to say something now. So uh, one thing about this, uh, this crisis, it gives us a chance to really realize what's important. And uh, we as an, as an institute know that. Larry shared with you that if you can just share some information that you've heard today, your passion and your your donations go a long way here. We are a very efficient organization with your donations. And so if you, you can do that. And I'll make one other deal with you. Uh, I'll follow up uh, by email with some information on our challenges in putting our campus right for COVID-19. We've, we've got to do a lot more uh, in the next few months to get our get, to be ready to do this influx of research so that 
And then I think the final point is if you ever thought, and Larry, you said this, but if you ever thought if you could, had needed to be convinced that a virus or a, uh, an epidemic, a pandemic could have the effect of this, uh, we, we will not ever forget that again, I believe. Uh, all you have to do is look at your, uh, uh, your uh, investments, your stocks, the, 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 uh, the organizations in the community that are hurting, the people that are hurting. And so uh, uh, this is an investment that's worth taking. Here's our Golden Circle Award. I hope you have one of these. If you don't, we can sure see that one gets to you. But uh, consider joining our Golden Circle at one of the levels. So thank you so much. And uh, we will wish you a good afternoon and have a great evening now. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye now.